So welcome. Hopefully people can hear me. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. And welcome to our second Food Risk Predictions webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to again to be joined by two very esteemed panel members who will take us through some interesting discussions today. And it's a follow on from a previous webinar we did approximately one month, six weeks ago. Uh, my name is Neil Marshall, and I'm the moderator for today's session. And with me, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Elliott, who is the Professor of Food Safety at Queen's University, Belfast, who is gonna give us some more very insightful information and maybe some breaking news today during his uh, presentation. I also have Yanis Stotis, who is the CTO and partner at Agrino, who are a technology company <clears throat> who are gonna give us some of the details around the risk uh, prevention exercise today. Apology, I've missed this slide yet. So there's the pictures of our panelists and hopefully you can see down the right-hand side, the people. I'm sure most people know Chris for his work in food fraud and in the UK and Ireland, and also across Europe and globally now as a very esteemed part of academia. And Yanis, who can also provide subject matter expertise from the technology and solutions to, to support the predictive analytics. So, Next slide, please. What is our goal today? So our goal today, as I said, is try to be interactive. We're gonna have a, uh, some questions and some data shared by Chris. And then we're gonna go into a demo and some insights from Yanis to talk about the Food Akai platform and how that can inform some of the technology and data because data is critical. But for our session today, I mean, the key two points are to get those industry and academic insights from Chris. And there are some real new breaking news, as I mentioned. And to see Chris discuss and debate some of the data that's in the platform and some of the information he's bringing forward. And also with Yanis to use that technology and try to use the technology to connect those insight between data and reality. And where does that convergence occur? So we can use that in our day-to-day -day, uh, work across the food industry, not only in a theoretical context, but also in a practical example. So <clears throat> trying to give you some data and insights that you can use in your day-to-day -day roles. So without further ado and much debate, I just wanna just again re-emphasize really the industry need for that data and why do we need it? Uh, we, we shared some of this previously on, on the previous webinar. But it's really more and more important than ever before now to avoid major incidents. We've been through a, a year and a longer now with the pandemic. And as Chris mentioned last time, maybe we're storing up some uh, incidents or issues for the future. And I know food fraud is one of those topics that's growing and, and we'll probably see more incidents because of the pandemic. And we need to be more proactive and less reactive using data, insights, and the future insights to give us that information, to do things ahead and plan and change our testing programs to make sure we're being aware of what's around the corner and to pre uh, prevent those issues happening by being more informed. So there's a whole piece around in informing and being prepared, but there's also the fact around data, multiple data points out there, and where do you see the, the wood from the trees? Because there's so much information. But one of those things, and again, I like the quote that Chris mentioned last time, you know, use our, our technology to inform us, to save money on the recalls, to invest in the future and put people like Chris out of a job. Yeah? So it's trying to be informed, trying to use that data and predict the future using AI and technology. So you can spend the money in a different way and not invest it afterwards on cleaning up the recalls in the crisis. So with that, I'd like to pass to the next slide and hand it over to Dr. Chris Elliott to give his insights for today, please, Chris. Many thanks, Neil. And uh, it's great to be part of this second webinar. Um, I think we had a lot of fun in the first one and for those of you who don't know me, I, I really do investigate serious issues about food safety, contamination, food fraud, 
locally, nationally and internationally. <clears throat> and uh, also, as Neil <clears throat> mentioned, I think the, 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 the risks associated with, with both food safety and fraud have only heightened over the last 18 months and, and most likely will continue to for, for some time to come. <clears throat> so maybe if we can flick on to the first slide. Data is complex, and I think all of us use data in some way to, to make decisions. And I think in terms of our food supply system, our supply chains or networks, as I prefer to call them, is they generate a huge amount of data. And I think we, we want to really start to get into a position where we can exploit that data and collect lots and lots of disparate data together to, to, to actually make sense out of it. And I, I talked to lots of people from, from the food industry and they are rich in data as well. And the problem is not quite sure what to do with it because it's layers. It's a layer, it's a spreadsheet, it's another spreadsheet. How do you bring all of that together? And I guess my, my really strong interest in connecting with Agrono over, over the last year or so is about that connectivity of data, the interpretation of the data. I just came off literally 30 minutes ago, uh, I'm part of the UN Summit on, on, on uh, our food system, and it was about food safety. And I was asked to present what I thought were the five biggest risks in terms of food safety going forward. And I put climate change number one, and I will not deviate from that. And I think the, the outcome of the discussions was absolutely climate change is going to have a massive, massive impact on the level of risks, the number of risks, <coughs> emerging risks. And it will be old risks in new places and new risks in new places. And there's going to be so many things that are going to happen over the next relatively short space of time, because <coughs> I can already see climate change having an impact on food safety. I, I spent quite a lot of time, 2019, part of 2020, investigating a, a particular uh, food uh, incident that, that caused hundreds of food poisoning incidents, killed five people, four of them young children, and, and it was directly related to climate change. So what we want to do now is, <coughs> yes, looking back over data is really important, <coughs> but that allows you to be you know, a little bit more reactive. And I think what we need to do is not only look at, at, at the data retrospectively, but in real time. And, and that will give us so much more information. So we could move to the next slide, please. Again, <coughs> expressions that we've all heard about that information is king. <coughs> Knowledge is power. And I think in, in the in the area, the arena of food safety and food fraud, that is absolutely true. I spend a lot of my time collecting information from from multiple sources. Um, some of it I would call open source, some of it closed source, a lot of it one-to-one -one conversations with, with different uh, informed people. And it's about collecting that information and interpreting that information. So access to the right information at the right at the right time is really very very important. From that, we 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 can understand risks in terms of what geographic region is now presenting us with the biggest problems, and do we source from those regions? <clears throat> If we source from those regions, should we introduce new measures of auditing, testing, and so forth? Or actually, if the, if the risk is so high, can we move that sourcing to somewhere else? <clears throat> but it's not only country-specific. You can get it down to commodity-specific, ingredient-specific, <clears throat> or even company-specific. And that is hugely important and insightful information for, for the food industry. So moving on, please. Now, this, this is a, a term that I came up with a, a few months ago, actually interacting with, with Agrino, and I call it 
my digital crystal ball. It's looking forward and looking forward based on data and data analytics. And I think in terms of predicting what the problems will be, not today, tomorrow, next week, but next month, the month after that, or even a year after that is incredibly important. <clears throat> Just to reiterate what, what Neil said was, if you as an organization can get away from being reactive, from having to deal with food recalls, <clears throat> from having to deal with having your name on, in a national newspaper, because <clears throat> often companies contact me to say, look, I, I've, I've been implicated in this food safety scandal, in this food fraud scandal, what do I do? I will tell you it's a challenge. It's a massive challenge. Challenge financially, reputationally, so, so many different ways. Now, over the past, yes, perfect, move on. That was great. Over the past week or so, I've had some, this is how I, I, I entertain myself. Working with AgriNo, and I've been trying to say here, based on my different sources of data, I think some of the big risks are. And then we're, we've been using the AgriNo uh, way of, of collating and, and, and analyzing information to say it's the same. So here's the first thing is, I'm going to ask you a question. You've got 20 or 30 seconds to answer. Then we're going to hear what your thoughts are. And then we will find out what collectively the AgriNo um, 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 uh, Food Akai system has said. And then I will give you my comments on whether I think it's correct or not. So one of the following ingredients have the highest increase in incidence over the next 12 months. And <clears throat> do you think it's poultry, oregano, or olives? <clears throat> so if you could vote for one of those now, <clears throat> just to think about <clears throat> what, what might be really on the radar screens and <clears throat> causing risks <clears throat> and uh, just give it some thought and then give us your vote now. Chris, maybe I'll just take advantage while we've just got a gap for the questions. I was also, as, as we spoke earlier, I was on the call with you this morning as well, the UN Summit. I thought some of your insights around the protein, the GMO and the plant baits were really interesting as well. I don't know whether you're going to cover that later, but I think the whole allergen piece is, is also very interesting. The fact of new emerging allergens that you mentioned as well. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> So we've got the results of our poll. This is a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest, except we didn't put no nil points because we know we know the UK doesn't get any points. <laughs> now, fifty percent oregano, thirty-eight percent. Or sorry, poultry, then oregano, olives. If we move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you very much. So here are one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, eight different ingredients that we looked at on the food Akai um, database. And if you look at the last column on the right hand side, and this is the prediction in terms of trends, what, what are likely to be the biggest issues. Flick down through that and you can see absolutely top of this league table is oregano. Poultry, actually, where, where the majority of people voted for, <clears throat> we don't see, or, or certainly Food Akai doesn't see any big issues at all. Oregano <clears throat> and the Food Akai said 400%. Now, independently, and when I, when I looked at that list, top of my list was Oregano. <clears throat> and I think probably in the next few weeks, there will be some breaking news about Oregano, which will absolutely vindicate this piece of data. So I think I, I give the 10 out of 10 to, to the uh, food archive for, for this one. So let's move forward to our next question, our next poll. So three more commodities, three, three particular issues that might crop up. Mineral oils present in wine, lead in ground turmeric, or fenbendazole in beef. Again, have a think about which of those you think might be the biggest problem that's going to emerge. Again, take, take a few seconds about this. <clears throat> I 
just to, to let you know that whenever these uh, slides were being put together, one of these uh, was already on the list and it was already top of my list even before we started to discuss, which I thought was, was uh, very, very insightful. <clears throat> so do we have a vote? <clears throat> And this time we've got lead ground turmeric, <clears throat> followed by then benzol and mineral oil. So thank you very much for that. So if we close the poll and then go on to our next slide. <clears throat> so again, here we've got uh, six or seven <clears throat> different types of ingredients and commodities. And <clears throat> what we look at in terms of herbs and spices, <clears throat> if you look at them, lead, chromium and mercury in ground fennel, in ground turmeric coming from India, uh, other issues with different types of herbs and spices as well. So I think if we could flick on to our next slide. Here's another question is in terms of increased uh, predicted risk for salmonella in pork, listeria in beef, or heavy metals in herbs and spices. Again, what, what do you think might be the biggest issue, the biggest risk that we're going to face over the next 12 months? A few more seconds to think about that. What are you going to pick? What would you like for dinner tonight? <clears throat> Salmonella, listeria or heavy metals? So we're going to get the results of our third poll very soon. <clears throat> Here it comes. And wow, 84% for heavy metals and herbs and spices. Now, I think 84% people voted for that because of the information that was on the previous slide. You know, there was a warning there that there, there is an issue. So <clears throat> this is the power of information, the power of data. So if we close the... Uh, the polling now and just look at these uh, uh, ingredients again. Thanks. So again, looking down through the list, absolutely heavy metals is and going to be an issue in herbs and spices. Now, what I'd like to just very quickly say, why is there issues with heavy metals and herbs and spices? Is it about accidental contamination or is it deliberate contamination? My view is it's a, it's a combination of both of those. <clears throat> Metals can get added, particularly lead can get added <clears throat> to some spices to increase the, uh, <clears throat> the color of it and, and the perceived value of that. <clears throat> and from my information sources is, and there has been quite a lot of that going on because the prices of particular herbs and spices is absolutely soaring now. So here we have an issue about supply and demand, which I think the Food Act uh, uh, database is picking up very nicely. Also interesting to see that the, the wine is coming up uh, uh, at a very high predicted value there. Now, it would be interesting to understand why the, the, the Food Act uh, database has picked this up. It was just I think quite interesting, yesterday I picked up an article to say that there's likely going to be massive fraud, not only in wine, but actually in the beverage industries <laughs> due to pandemic related issues. So I think this, uh, this data that's coming is really, really very powerful. Okay, so if we could move on to our next slide. So moving away from ingredients, moving to commodities, here we have your choice. <clears throat> what would worry you the most in terms of sourcing? Sourcing from Egypt, sourcing from China, or sourcing from Turkey? What do you think <clears throat> they, they would be in terms of, of, of risk where you source your materials from? They're, you know, they're all countries that have a lot of food exports. They, there are countries that do a lot of food processing as well. And so it might not be the country of origin of the particular commodities or ingredients, but are passing through, particularly in processing. So again, we'll see what the uh, participants, which I say we have more than 100 people on this webinar, which is fantastic. So here we have uh, 
China absolutely uh, uh, as our number one worry. And again, I would if, when I saw this data, I, I picked China, and but I also had Turkey quite high up on my 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 risk register as well, mainly because of the amount of processing they do there, mainly because of the amount of processing of herbs and spices that that they do in Turkey. So if we could close that poll and then just move on to the the next slide, please. And actually, here here we can see the three biggest hits in terms of trending countries. I guess this, this is the, the, uh, the graph, the map that you really don't want to appear on, but we see that the China absolutely very darkly colored. We see Brazil and we see Mexico. Um, none of those surprise me. I've, I've heard quite a lot of issues coming out of China. Uh, many, many different issues arising there. And some of it is about fraud, some of it's about safety, some of it's pandemic related, some of it's about water shortages in particular parts of the country. It, it, it's a very complex uh, business going on. Interested to see Mexico, and because recently in some of my lectures on food fraud, I've been warning about Mexico, and I've been warning about Mexico because there has been more and more reports about organized crime, drug cartels, taking over different parts of, of the industry there, particularly avocados. And if you, if you want to, to read something to scare you, Google blood avocados and you'll see what's going on in Mexico. Brazil is a country absolutely um, massively impacted by the pandemic. And I think that might be why Brazil is trending highly there as well. So it's about one thing is getting the data, the, the, the other part is the interpretation. So thank you for that. So we'll maybe move on. <clears throat> now, I think this is the final question or the final poll. <clears throat> In terms of an emerging food fraud issue, <clears throat> you've got saffron, olive oil, and milk. <clears throat> three very, very different commodities, three very, very different ingredients. <clears throat> um, some quite bespoke in terms of the saffron, olive oil globally traded, but milk, <clears throat> one of the true commodities that, that, that is global in nature. So I'm <clears throat> interested to see what you're going to pick for saffron. Or sorry, <clears throat> I mean, there was a little clue there. Sorry, I gave it away. I hope you've already voted. So <clears throat> let, let, let's see what the, uh, <clears throat> the audience thinks about this. Saffron, olive oil and milk. So it's not surprising that olive oil <clears throat> is, is appearing front and central, uh, and saffron and milk following up in, in, in quite even numbers. So if we could go on to our next slide and see what, what Food Akai tells us about those three different commodities. And we could just close the poll. For some time, probably most of this year, my own sources of information intelligence gathering has said saffron is going to be a major issue about supply and demand. And here we have, this is was breaking news very recently, is a massive fraud was uncovered by Europol, the European Police Force, looking at organized crime working in saffron. And the, the backdrop to this is, Iran is the world's biggest producer of saffron, but actually Spanish saffron is higher in value. And it looks like a lot of the Iranian saffron was, was being smuggled into Spain, being relabeled and, and called Spanish. And you know, the value of this particular fraud was, was over 10 million euros. This is big business, really big business. So next slide, please. So, that was just uh, my overview, my little you know, few insights about uh, what I've tried to predict using my sources of information, what the food Akai does. I tell you, there is very good overlap, there's good harmonization, but sometimes the food Akai uh, 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 databases will throw up things that I were not on my radar screen before, and I think that's the big value of it. And my research group now, we are constantly mining this, uh, 
this uh, food archive database for so many so much information now. So what I'm going to do is stop talking, close my mouth, open up my ears, start to listen, and I'm going to pass you on to Janice now, who's going to talk a lot more about the what sits beneath the 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 bonnet of of, of uh, Agrino and Food Archive and how the system actually works. So Janice, over to you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was so interesting. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing this breaking news. So first of all, I would like to introduce, if we go to the next slide, please, I would like to introduce our company briefly. Uh, we were founded in 2008 and we specialized in data management problems for food and agriculture. Throughout all these years, uh, we have been working for the food industry, uh, we have been working with academia and, and international organizations to deliver uh, some of the most important projects in the area of uh, agriculture and food, like the uh, scientific, the very important uh, scientific search engine uh, that is run by FAO, uh, the data discovery and data sharing uh, project uh, in the global food safety uh, uh, private public partnership. Uh, work, working with many of uh, the food companies uh, that uh, would like to transform uh, the risk assessment uh, uh, to uh, a more digital uh, format and to a more digital uh, methodology uh, that can uh, be used to drive the decisions, the very important decisions. Today, we are particularly focusing on big data processing and artificial intelligence to extract the food safety insights, but also predictions related to the food, to the global supply chain. Next slide, please. What we do is that we use our data and our technology to support the food safety professionals make effective and timely decisions, making sense out of uh, the millions of data records that exist out there. And how we actually do this is that we have developed a technology that uh, provides uh, easy access to all these very important insights that the food safety expert needs. We have developed a technology that uh, uses the power of the artificial intelligence, but it uses also the knowledge and the expertise uh, of uh, the domain uh, expert, of the food safety experts, in order to deliver, to provide food risk assessment and prediction insights in a visual and easy to understand way, and actually to deliver something that can be actionable, that can be used to take very important mitigation actions and to finally prevent risks. In the next slide, please, what is uh, behind all this uh, is millions of data records. So we have a continuously growing database that is scanning and processing information from 97 currently data sources different types of uh, information, including recalls, border rejections, inspection results, results of the laboratory testing uh, monitoring programs that uh, are uh, run by the uh, authorities, suppliers information, and all this information is processed and used uh, in order to deliver and to produce the insights and the predictions. Our prediction models are continuously updated with all the, this, uh, with the latest information. So it's not a static version of the models, but we uh, ensure that we have, that our models have the knowledge uh, using the most frequent information. Our prediction is based on a robust methodology. Uh, we, we have developed uh, something that we call the intelligence was equation. Uh, in this equation, in this approach, we always start with a business question. It is very important for us to understand what is really the problem that the food safety experts need to solve. 
what is exactly the question that we need to answer. And to do so, first of all, we identify together with the food safety experts, which are the parameters, the drivers that change the risk, that affect, affect the risks. And behind these parameters, which are the data sources that we can use. So this is the data collection part. After doing that, we are selecting the best uh, artificial intelligence method, the best prediction method that uh, fits to the uh, nature of this problem and that can be used to predict a very important indicator that will give us the answer uh, to the business question, that, we, that will give us, that will address the problem that we are trying to solve. Next slide, please. So our approach, our risk prediction approach is based on four steps. The first step is the risk identification using all the scanning, uh, all this scanning process that I described. Uh, we are trying to identify, to monitor and to identify the risks for any ingredients. The second step is to perform a risk assessment for all the ingredients for thousands of the ingredients that we have in the food database, that, that database. The next step is to perform a risk assessment for the suppliers. So using the information of all the uh, recalls of the inspections of the border rejections, we are applying risk assessment algorithms and we are delivering a risk score for the suppliers that can be used to prioritize audits, but also certificates, uh, certificates of analysis, laboratory testing and uh, results and the corresponding plans in order to have the best uh, control of the risk. And the final step is using all this information, of course, to have timely risk prediction. Next slide, please. So let's try to see all the things that uh, Chris described, uh, but also uh, the methodology that I, I described. Let, let's see how this works in action. Let's see these things in action. Uh, so I will share my screen in, in order to show you how these predictions, how these insights can be accessed and can be provided by a platform like Fudakai. So as I mentioned, Fudakai is collecting information from many different uh, data sources and can be customized because it's very difficult to mine the information, all this information. The uh, platform can be customized to specific ingredients that is of interest for your supply chain. It can be customized and adapted to any, to all the ingredients that you are using. And this will give you the ability, will give us the ability to monitor the trends for these ingredients. So for instance, using uh, analytics techniques, we can identify which are the ingredients from the ones that I have in my supply chain that have increasing issues. So here we can see on the left side of the screen, the increasing issues block of the dashboard that the Kudakai platform provides, where you can see uh, which are the ingredients that have a high uh, ingredient, uh, increasing trend, sorry. So we see, for instance, that ground turmeric is increasing the trend based on the reports that uh, have been provided by the national authorities. We have a high increase during the last months, the same stands for sesame seeds uh, and uh, for cumin and also other ingredients. And this is a live information. So every time that we have uh, a new uh, information announced by a national authority, these trends are updated. On the other side, we can see the emerging risks. We can see increasing and new issues for all these ingredients. So, but this is the risk estimation. This is the risk assessment view. So we are using the information of the 
hazard severity, but also of the frequency, the information of the frequency of the incidents and of specific hazards happening for specific ingredients to estimate a risk score. So this blog can provide you the information for all the ingredients that uh, you have in your supply chain, the information about which risks are at a high level, which risks are increasing, and which risks may be new and I need to take them into account. So when we see this information, this information, we can go deeper and study more about this information. So if we select, uh, assume that uh, we are a, a company that is sourcing poultry meat from a, a region like Brazil, which Chris mentioned, but uh, is one of the trending countries for the next months. So I can click to view more data and to perform a very good hazard analysis for this specific product ingredients category. So we can see which is the trend of the incidents. We can select the specific region so we can focus only on issues coming from these specific regions, uh, from the specific region, from Brazil. So we see that the majority of the issues that is causing this uh, increase in the risk is, uh, are the biological hazards. And specifically, you can drill down by selecting the category and see which subcategory of the hazards are affecting very much uh, poultry meat coming from Brazil. And specifically, you can still go in even become more specific and going deeper by selecting pathogen, uh, which what types of pathogen is, this, is that? It's pathogenic bacteria. And finally, to see which are uh, which bacteria are the ones that are causing this increase in risk, and also to go behind the diagrams and study all this data. And we can also perform a risk assessment, a full risk assessment of this specific uh, category. Uh, and this risk assessment will help us very in a very easy way and very fast to identify which are the increasing uh, hazards, which are the increasing risks. So for instance, we see that salmonella is increasing by 25%. And I am repeating that all these data, all these, uh, sorry, all these insights and assessments are based on historical data that we have. Uh, and we can see which of the uh, risks uh, are decreasing, but we can see also if there are any new risk and I can be focused very much and see specifically what is happening in each case. So for instance, we can see if we go down, we can see a case of uh, uh, labeling this description, like uh, declaring that is uh, less fat, but the product actually had more, more fat. We can see also cases like fipronil that is decreasing right now. So this may help you to perform a deep risk analysis. But what if we want to go one step ahead, to go to the prediction part? What if we want to predict which will be the uh, hazards or which will be the trends based on all this historical data for a category like uh, poultry meat? So here we provide an approach that is based on four steps a predictive approach that is based on four steps. The first step is actually what we see on this block where we can, we have all our ingredients and the system automatically checks and the prediction models uh, provide us the, informa the information for which ingredients we will have more incidents during the next months. So we see here that one of these uh, category of ingredients is also the poultry meat, uh, poultry meat that we were analyzing in terms of hazard, but also in terms of risk just a few minutes before. So the second step that I can do is that I can check the hazards. I can check, check specifically using the predictive analytics, what will be the trend of the incidents. So I see that it is predicted that there will be a slight increase of the incidence. 
uh, but not something that is uh, very uh, very big in terms of the trend but still it is very important to see which are the hazards that are likely to increase uh, and uh, applying the models we can see here that uh, based on the information that we have and uh, using the predictions that the models are providing to us we see that salmonella is one uh, hazard that will increase uh, in an important uh, has an important increasing trend for the next months and uh, the same stands for different serotypes of salmonella but also for cases like listeria and uh, this this trend of the hazards uh, can also help us to uh, provide a prediction for the uh, risk for poultry meat so we see here that uh, we see a risk uh, a heat map for risk uh, for the main risks for poultry meat and we see that salmonella is at a medium level and uh, the predicted based on the prediction models the salmonella will go at a higher at a high level of risk and this is further analyzed using the evolution of the risk for uh, salmonella in uh, poultry meat and you can see specifically how this risk will evolve during the next months. One very important thing is that we are predicting also the emerging risks based on the latest information that we are collecting. So we see here that uh, in the case of poultry meat, we have some cases with misdescription that will, uh, will be increasing and emerging uh, within the next months, but also a, a new serotype of salmonella that, that was identified and will also affect some products uh, and uh, this kind of analysis can this kind of predictions can help us to see which are the products or the suppliers that will be affected because uh, the products or the suppliers are providing to us this uh, ingredient this uh, type of ingredient so we can see here that one product and one supplier will be affected. The, the models are providing also other uh, products or ingredients that may be affected by the increase of salmonella. So you can see also other products that uh, uh, based on the knowledge of the models may be affected by this increase of salmonella. And a very important thing is that you can see also the trend for the country that based on the predictions it seems that for brazil uh, the trend of the incidents will increase during the next months so we use this four-step analysis that uh, helps us to identify which are the ingredients that have and will have increasing uh, trend for the incidents which are the hazards that will likely increase for this ingredient we also check the risks, but we also uh, are sure and uh, we can immediately identify how your finished product and suppliers are affected. So I will give uh, some more examples in terms of prediction. Uh, we discussed a lot about uh, ground turmeric. Chris mentioned the case of ground turmeric. So this is, uh, this is a specific ingredient uh, that uh, it seems that will have an increase of incident during the next uh, uh, 12 months. As you can see, one of the hazards that are likely to increase is the presence of lead, one of the heavy metals, but also salmonella, it seems that uh, will be increased. So again, you can see uh, how the risk profile is uh, affected and will change. Uh, and also how the uh, salmonella in this case will, incre will increase, sorry, for uh, such an ingredient like ground turmeric. And in the same way as I also presented for the case of uh, poultry meat coming from Brazil, if you get your ground turmeric from India, you can also see the trend of uh, the incidence coming uh, of the ingredients that are sourced from India. So you can see also uh, the trending, uh, the trend for this country. 
And again, you can also see other cases, like for instance, if you are sourcing chili peppers from Mexico, uh, which is again a country that uh, Chris highlighted, that based on the predictions, it seems that uh, we will have more incidents within the next few months. We can see here that chili peppers will have more incidents during the next months. The hazards that are likely to increase are several uh, chemical issues like fipronil, uh, fipro fipronil which uh, was present in the past in the supply chain, but it seems that the models based on the recent formation that they predict that we will have more issues in the future. We can see which are emerging hazards. There are a lot of emerging issues, mainly a link to chemicals. So there are several chemicals like oxamil, uh, that, uh, but also uh, ethylene oxide that seems that will affect also this, uh, uh, the chili peppers. And again, uh, you can see the trend of uh, the Mexico uh, for the incidents for the uh, next uh, few months. So I can be, I can stay here for hours and present you all the information, all these uh, uh, predictions. Uh, but uh, I think that we need to switch back to the presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I will be very happy using all this data, but also clarifying uh, how we are uh, uh, producing these predictions to answer these questions uh, during the Q and A. Just, you, just Yanis, before you go back, I just fantastic uh, overview there of the, of the platform. But when I see it, I think, well, Yanis is obviously an expert. Could I, you know, interrogate and use the platform like that? You know, how difficult is it for people to use and do what you just did? You know, for the people on the audience. As you saw. Uh, it's one of the main goals when we, we were developing all these insights and uh, uh, developing all the services for our platform is to provide a really easy access to all this information. So it's super easy. I can confirm that because most of the people that are starting using the system within a few minutes are uh, very familiar with the system. They can find with few clicks uh, all the information that they need. Of course, there is always a live chat that uh, the people can use and we can provide support or any clarification. And okay. we, we know that uh, what to, changing from uh, the current way of uh, estimating risk with uh, robust methodologies that are already used to a more digital way is something that needs uh, need, uh, change. Yeah? So we are here for the people, uh, for the companies that want to make this step to move to a more digital uh, risk assessment and risk prediction. Uh, we can help them by studying the current process, by redesigning the, the process and helping in the change management. Uh, and uh, this will uh, enable the, uh, to, uh, we will uh, help to automate the process. Uh, so uh, it's very user friendly, uh, Neil, but uh, what I want to, uh, for, for you to keep is that we are here to facilitate the process of changing uh, the way that risk assessment is performed today with the way that you want to the risk assessment to be data-driven, to, to integrate all the knowledge and the experience that you have right now and to optimize the process. Thanks, Yanis. The next slide. Yep. Okay, so thank you, Yanis, for the demo. I think it's transitioning back to me again there. So you got the benefit there of the expertise of Chris for the science and the academia and the fantastic insights he's given us already there to combine. And then the platform that uh, Yanis has just described. 
And even for someone who's not so technically advanced like me, I think you could see click, 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 and you go down and you get all the data in one place, which is a fantastic way of doing your risk assessment and analysis. And really the benefits, you know, out of that, you know, the, the real bonus for me is getting the insights and showing Chris's example how he's leading his team and their researchers are using that data. And they're adding uh, insights that they're finding from industry and, and research. And then also from the technology and the platform, it's allowing you to use that data to make decisions. And I think this is the critical piece for people who, uh, in industry who want to use the tool and the platform. It's also being aware of what your suppliers are doing. As Chris mentioned, some of those supply chains get complex, particularly like the avocado example, the turmeric example, the oregano. You need to be looking at your suppliers. You can potentially then monitor how you assess and check on the suppliers. You can change your testing and inspection programs based on what you see from the data from the platform and the insights you get from Chris. And the main thing really is trying to avoid recalls. We want a safer food supply system and we want the food to be safe for everybody. You know, recalls affect everybody. And I think the other watch out that Chris mentioned apart from the climate change is the almost, hopefully not, but probably a backlog of issues around wine, beverages, food from the pandemic, because there's been things stuck in docks and, and transportation that's probably gonna get tried to be reused and re resold elsewhere. So I think that's a big uh, opportunity for using technology and looking at the data to predict. So next slide, please. Um, I think what, what we're just quite trying to show here is really the agrono slide to show they have different models that cover all these areas, particularly useful around hazard analysis and supply checks. But there's a basic, there's a premium, and there's a diamond uh, package. The prices obviously would vary, but the main thing is the company is agile and they can adjust the offerings and the support depending on the size of the company, the amount of people that you have and you wish to use the platform. But the main thing is how you automate your processes and build it into the solution. But the company are really agile and can be uh, adapted to your requests. So next slide, please. What we're also saying, scan the, trying to move again with technology, use, use the code, scan it uh, with your phone or your camera phone to, to, to use the scan. Get, get in touch with Anna and the team. They can work out a program to give you insights on your specific ingredients from your company. They can do a demo, they can set that up for you and give you some of these live predictions around what could happen for you for your production from your products. So I think, you know, that's a, it's a good step to take uh, following this webinar. So please uh, investigate that further. And then next slide, I think we're gonna try to go to some Q and A and some questions. I don't know, Anna, if we've got some already. Uh, just looking at the chat. Yeah, we have several, several questions. Neil, Sam. Some are already answered, but I, I can start answering some things and you can complement. Sure, you. sure. So which one do you want to use first from the chat room? Uh, I will start from the last one and we'll go. The go traceability back. question. Yeah. So for the audience, yeah. What is the role of traceability here? That's the question. Yeah. So there's another one, but I will answer both. So what is the role of traceability? Uh, we rely on the... Uh, location information that we have uh, from the reports. Uh, so if they are mentioning a country as an origin of specific uh, ingredient, we will use this information and uh, we don't have any further information to be more specific in terms of the region, okay? If they don't uh, give us this information in the reports. Uh, but what we have in addition to that is in some cases we have the UPC numbers. Uh, so we have some more information that can be used to identify if this is an incident 
uh, that uh, is connected uh, with a specific we have UPCs and also lot numbers. So you can check if this is uh, uh, affecting a specific lot, uh, a specific batch of uh, an ingredient that you are getting. So I'm saying this because this has happened in the past. We have uh, companies that we are working together that uh, uh, they uh, were notified with an alarm that there was an incident. We checked, we provided the lot number or the information they checked. So they made sure if this will be affecting. But in, in any case, we always suggesting that having the trends at the level of the country, specifically for risk, is something very important because the traceability issue is not solved throughout the supply chain. So it's better to have more information and to be more sensitive than trying to be more accurate and lose some very critical information. The next question is uh, about the risk score based on the number of the incidents. Uh, if we are using only the previous year or all the incidents that we have in the database. We are using uh, the maximum uh, period that we have used is 20 years of data. But in order to select the optimum period of time, we perform, we apply validation uh, methodologies and we select the period that uh, gives us the best accuracy for, for the prediction models. Okay. Just trying to do multitask here and look at the question yeah, <laughs> so yeah. at the same time. I was trying to find one for Chris to answer. I don't know if there's one that you saw, Chris, that you'd want to give a response to. Uh, Actually, the, the question that you asked, Neil, was how, how user-friendly is the system? Yeah. Uh, I think it's an important question because uh, you know Agrino have very kindly given access uh, had access to the database for quite a while, but I've been asking over the last couple of months to get access. You know, can this student do a piece of work? Can this student do a piece of work? I think Giannis, the last time I asked you was about two days ago for for one of my students, and today I got a, an email from that student saying. This is unbelievable. Look what I was able to find because she was searching for particular problems with, with illegal pesticides. So that was, I think that's a clear indication that it is unbelievably user-friendly because often it takes you a while to, to, to find how to, how to navigate systems. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And I think, you know, your other comments earlier around the herbs and spices and the analogy between what you'd seen and what you were hearing to what was in the tool is also a good testament to the data. You know, you can always question the data, but it's the intersection, I think, that you're providing with your insights that's really useful. Yes, and, and also, you know, there, there are some things that the Food Act <clears throat> database is throwing up that is not on our radar screen. And, and as you can imagine, those are the ones that we are really interested to drill down in terms of what is really going on here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, any other questions? Let's just have a look. Uh, some compliments to you, Yanis, on the insightfulness of the score. Uh, I think someone's asked about, do you use any kind of BI or Bayesian algorithm? I don't know if that's it's, one for you, Yanis. It's too complicated for me, that one. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, yes, yes, we are using. Uh, we are using several artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, algorithms. Uh, specifically Bayesian networks, we are not using Bayesian networks, but uh, we know that uh, this is one of the methodologies that can very well integrate the knowledge of the experts uh, with uh, the data for each parameter, with, with many different parameters that may be affecting uh, risk. So the, this is one of the things that we would like definitely to, to try. Uh, and also, I just see, I, sorry, I just see another one here. That maybe this is a question for your team as well for after the webinar. But it's a use case example where you can share in terms of using uh, saving cost savings. I think that you have some of those case studies already. Maybe Anna can share afterwards, or people contact can contact Anna for information. There's some case studies already. I remember on herbs and spices that you did previously. 
So I'm sure you could that can be shared. What what I can, yeah, what I can share, Neil, this is an excellent question. What I can share right now is that there are two ways, two very important uh, ways of uh, saving cost. And based on the experience working with the companies, uh, using all this insight prediction, the first is that the ultimate goal is to prevent uh, a recall. So uh, having early the notification about an adulteration in honey was something that helped uh, pre previously uh, one of the companies that we are working together to uh, save, to, to prevent the recall. The same was with the ethylene oxide. Another very important uh, uh, cost saving factor is that using this information, you can optimize uh, the laboratory testing plan that you want to apply to specific uh, ingredients. And of course, it's always the matter of time that you need to spend to uh, at least monitor all this information. Whereas here with one click or doing just a two minutes uh, visit uh, on the platform, you can have a very good horizon uh, monitoring of all the risks. Absolutely, I think that's the other bit we didn't touch on today because we were you know, basically focusing on, on, on the predictive analytics, but the dashboard inside the tool gives you all that in one place. So you only need to go one place every day and you can get the information. I know we're about at time now and Anna will slap my hand if we don't do the webinar, uh, post webinar, question. So we'd like to, I think, one more poll just to give people a rating on how good or bad we were today. I think uh, that would be useful. So if you can finally complete before you log off, the recording will be shared and available. Uh, thanks again. Tremendous insights again from Chris, as always. And thank you also to yourself, Yanis, for giving a deep dive uh, demo on the platform, on the tool. Uh, please complete the webinar evaluation and contact Anna and you can see the contacts there for further information. If you'd like to analyze your suppliers, if you'd like to do a de demo, contact the team. They're more than happy to set up sessions and to help you protect your food supply. So thank you everybody. Thank you again, Chris. Thank you, Yanis. And it's been a thank pleasure you. as always doing this session. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for your attention for participating thank you thank you everybody bye bye bye, bye.